Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Thinking Like a Bank, where we show you how to think like a bank using the same strategies and principles that banks use to help you find more financial freedom in your life. I'm your host, Sari Ibrahim. So I have with us today a very special guest. We're going to take a deep dive into tax credits and how they could help business owners. Uh, I'm very passionate about taxes um, in the sense of saving taxes short term and long term, of course, uh, doing this strategically. And I think this is also consistent with the theme of the show of thinking like a bank. We're thinking about how to reposition our dollars, how to give them uh, multiple duties, multiple functions. And as you may know, I'm not a tax professional, I'm not a CPA, but I have somebody today who is. Uh, his name is Randy Crabtree. He brings more than 30 years of public accounting and tax consulting experience to TriMerit. Throughout his career, Randy has worked closely with top company executives on tax planning and preparation engagements. Prior to co-founding TriMerit, he was managing partner of a certified public accounting firm in Palatine, Illinois. His firm handled accounting and tax consulting activities for companies in a wide variety of industries. Randy regularly speaks at seminars and accounting conferences. He conducts CPE presentations around the country on the R&D tax credit, cost segregation studies, and employee retention credits, and has had, has had numerous articles published on the subjects. Randy also hosts the accounting industry podcast called The Unique CPA, which keeps CPAs at the forefront of the changing face of public accounting on ha and by having conversations with fascinating leaders and bringing you their stories, insights, and advice. Fun fact about Randy, uh, he's a partner in the Beer Temple, a craft beer bar and bottle shop that was recently named one of the top 31 craft beer bars in the country and the top craft beer store in Illinois. Randy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Sorry that you had to uh, read that long introduction, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Oh, th thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm excited. I want to talk about the R&D tax credit and the employee retention credit. Uh, before we jump into that, uh, tell us about, about your background and how you got into accounting. Yeah, the, um, well, that we can go for a long time. So we'll, <laughs> we'll do the short version. I actually didn't graduate with an accounting degree. I, I graduated with a computer science degree. And and after a few years, I uh, realized that accounting is probably where I should have went. So I went back to school and and. Uh, and uh, got my, technically did not get my accounting degree, got enough hours to sit for the CPA exam. So I became a CPA. So that was a long time ago. Um, so I'm old is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, been doing this for a while. After about four years in public accounting, which for me started in 88, I think mm -hmm. is the year I started, um, started my own firm and, and we grew that to a, a, a decent uh, size uh, local firm. Um, but I got a little burnt out on tax season and I got, honestly, you know, based on what you're saying too, I got a little tired of, you know, we would do everything we could to save taxpayers as much money as possible. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, you know, I, I was looking for better opportunities to put money back into businesses. So we merged our firm with another firm back in 2006. And I took that opportunity to leave and uh, started Trimerit. And, and Trimerit, as you mentioned, is a specialty tax firm. Mm -hmm. We just deal with credits and incentives. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty cool now because anytime I'm dealing with a client, I'm talking about how much money we can put back in their business, mm -hmm. how much money we can put back in their bank account. Mm -hmm. And so it's been uh, it's been a fun ride for the last uh, 15 years now. And uh, and uh, we'll see how much longer we're going to go with this. Uh, the, the firm will go on forever. I won't. <laughs> um, so um, we have we've built a really nice firm that uh, covers uh, business around the country and we support CPA firms. So that that's my background. Okay. And then just to be clear, like your, your target clients are usually other CPA firms. Is that right? Yeah. So our business, the, the fact that I came up a public accounting, you know, my thought process was I would never want someone going to sell tax services to my client, mm -hmm. you know? And so what we've always done is we've gone and we've educated the CPAs on the things that we do mm -hmm. and how they can bring these services to their clients and help their clients save money. And so for the most part, um, our business 90 plus percent comes from CPA firms. We, we, we build relationships with firms around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, they realize the things that we do are very complex mm -hmm. and we are experts at them. And so they bring us in, introduce us to their client. We get a small portion of the tax uh, return done mm -hmm. from the credit and incentive standpoint and then give it to the CPA and then they prepare the rest of the tax return. Okay, that makes sense. So it's like, like, uh, just to be clear, when you said complex, there's a distinction, right, between I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think uh, traditional CPAs are the, the kind of the normal, quote unquote, normal way of, of, of how CPAs operate is they do more so uh, deductions, right? And that's different from using credits. 
Yeah, credit. So there's the tax code, is, you know, which I'm sure you've never read, and yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest reading it. Um, but the tax code is gigantic. Mm -hmm. And so as CPAs, and obviously I'm a CPA, so I'll lump myself in there. As CPAs, we know what exists in the code. We always know that there's something additional out there. You know, we'll hear something about, you know, you know, with R&D tax credit. Oh, I have a manufacturing client. That's right. I should talk to him about R&D tax credit. Mm -hmm. As the CPA, I'm not going to be an expert in that because most of the time the R&D tax credit, and we'll jump into that I'm yeah. assuming later, but mm -hmm. most of that in general is going to be engineering based. Mm -hmm. And so CPAs don't have engineering knowledge. They don't have that expertise. And so, so as CPAs, we identify opportunities exist exist for our taxpayers to save taxes, but we cannot be an expert in every part of the tax code. It's just not possible. The, the, the code is just way too big. And so mm -hmm. that's why a specialist like us exist. Okay. Let's jump into it now. That's this is actually interesting. Engineers. So engineers are involved with the R&D tax credit. And I guess, what is the R&D tax credit and, and, and kind of how do we use it? Yeah. So yeah, that's a good, a good, a good point. Let me define the R&D tax credit mm -hmm. because when you think R&D, Mm -hmm. the most part people probably first think is you know white lab coats and you know sitting in a pharmaceutical <laughs> clean room and working you know with you know cr you know creating the coronavirus vaccine that kind of stuff you, that's what the technology <laughs> you think of with r d mm -hmm. but um the r d tax credit in Congress's eyes, which in, in the IRS's code wise is is a little more straightforward and really to qualify a business needs to look at the projects that they're working on internally and see if those projects meet a four part test, which is defined mm -hmm. in the code. And those four parts are, do I have a new or improved product or process? So if I'm, if I'm let's say uh, in a manufacturer and I'm manufacturing a widget, widget you know, just to pick something, or mm -hmm. let's pick something real, I'm manufacturing here. Uh, for all of those watching a <laughs> video, I'm manufacturing a water bottle, um, you know, so that's my product, obviously. Mm -hmm. I have a product now. I've met number one. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have a process too, because I have to figure out how I'm going to manufacture mm -hmm. this. Am I going to metal stamp it? Am I going to whittle it? Am I going to you know, injection mold it? What, how, what's the process I'm going to go through? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to talk manufacturing right now yeah, yeah. as we do this segment of the what qualifies or how define the R&D, but it's not just a manufacturing okay. credit. And that's a misconception out there. It's only for manufacturers. It's not. And we okay. can dig into that a little bit as we go. Um, and so new improved product or process, there has to be some kind of technology involved with what I'm working mm -hmm. on. So, you know, uh, engineering, computer science, material sciences, chemistry, biology, some kind of hard science involved mm -hmm. with what I'm doing. There has to be, number three, there has to be uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You know, so I cannot know, maybe I can know how I'm going to manufacture this uh, Yeti water bottle, uh, plug for Yeti, um, <laughs> Yeti water bottle here. Better at it than I was yesterday. Um, that's good enough to qualify for the credit. So, so, you know, uncertainty can be all the way to the, you know, can I develop a time machine uncertainty? I don't know if I can do that, but it doesn't have to be to that level. It has to be to the, can I, it can be to the, can I do what I'm doing currently better, faster, cheaper, more efficient, less waste, less operations, be more profitable. And then the fourth part is because I have uncertainty, I'm going to experiment. And experimentation is, you know, trial and error. I'm going to, you know, computer model. I'm going to mathematical equations. I'm going to, it's basically evaluating diff different alternatives to mm -hmm. see if I can come up with a solution. So just to make those long answers short, new or improved product or process, technology involved, some level of uncertainty, and then I'm going to experiment. If mm -hmm. I have those four parts on something that I'm working on in my business, that's a project we want to look at to see if it qualifies for the R&D tax credit. Okay. And then how do we document? I'm sure there has to be documentation, right? To this, how do you do it? Could it just be like um, a Google drive with documents that you just keep track of, or does it have to be an official way of tracking? So, so what, it's pretty um, documentation is key to keeping yeah. your credit. I mean, you mm -hmm. can have, you can have a credit all day long. You can meet that four part test, but if you can't document it, yeah, I, I can't advise you to take the credit because you need to be able to support that. So documentation in a manufacturing setting, 
or in a software development setting, which is another major user of the credit, is always there. It exists, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be in a separate Google Drive. It can be, that helps, but it doesn't have to be somewhere separate. It just has to be in manufacturing. I have my engineering notes. I have my design, you know, my CAD design. Mm -hmm. I have my test results. I have my, you know, meeting minutes where we had a group of people that were in this meeting talking about a new product we want to develop. You know, I, I, there, every manufacturer has these things that exist already. If we've never done the R&D tax credit with them, or if they haven't done it in general, you know, we'll educate them on, you know, how to maybe keep those in one spot easier mm -hmm. to identify. But when we go in and help a business, we take all that and we accumulate it into a document that supports the credit. So that's part of our responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, but we can also help make that documentation stronger for taxpayers, because, again, documentation is key uh, to keeping your credit. OK, and then. Um... Um, is, are there like types of businesses? Like, for example, does it have to be LLC, S Corp, C Corp, sole proprietor? Are there any like limits or restrictions on the type of structure, entity structure? No, any entity structure can, can take the credit. It's okay. just meeting that four part test. So sole okay. proprietor could take it. Uh, okay. a, a public C corporation could take it, you know, uh, you know, public, uh, you know, limited partnership, all the, any type of entity, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. As long as you meet that four part test, uh, you can qualify. Um, Maybe I should expand on the benefits because you kind of asked that before yeah, of yeah. the credit. Okay, yeah. we can go wherever you want. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, you're in control. <laughs> All, right. All right, so don't tell me that. I'll take over. So, <laughs> um, uh, um, so the so the R and D tax credit. Um, normally, if you hear tax credit, you know the most at least CPAs will think, okay, I need to offset taxes with this. It's mm -hmm. a credit to offset taxes, which for the most part, that's the case. It's an income tax offset. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and so for the most taxpayers, they need to be paying tax to use this. Mm -hmm. That actually took a change in 2017 with some new laws that came out um, that said, if you're a startup business, mm -hmm. And they define startup really as someone who's been in business. I'm going to summarize it. I mean, make it simpler, but five years or less in business, the law really says less than five years of revenue, mm -hmm. but let's assume you have less than five years of revenue and your current year's revenue is less than $5 million. I can actually take the credit. If I don't have any income tax to offset, I can make an election to offset payroll taxes. So if I'm employing people, I can still use the credit, which is was a nice benefit that came into play mm -hmm. uh, with taxpayers. You know, what is that? Four or five years ago? Wow, time's flying. Uh, to back in 2017. The other thing that changed in 2017. So credits in general, general credits can offset cannot offset AMT alternative mm -hmm. minimum tax. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of AMT. I'm guessing you you have. But <laughs> yes. so alternative minimum tax is just almost like a secondary tax return that everybody does. You just don't realize that that secondary return exists. And if the alternative minimum tax is higher than your regular tax, well, then you pay additional taxes. And most credits can't reduce yeah, that's AMT. Yeah. Well, the IRD tax credit got a new definition back in 2017 that said, if I have average gross receipts of less than, less than I'm going real technical on no, this. No, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, less than $50 million of average gross receipts for the last three years, I can ignore AMT and I can reduce my tax below that minimum threshold that has been set. So the, ta the R&D tax credit in general over the last four or five years has gotten a lot more lucrative to a lot more businesses because there's been a lot of hurdles that have mm -hmm. been eliminated. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a nice way to put money back into your business. And then just to kind of paint the idea of this in the listener's mind is there's a, there's a philosophical reason right behind the R&D tax credit. It's so that Congress and the IRS can help businesses in the United States become more uh, technologically savvy uh, to be able to compete internationally. Is that, is that the reason for the underlying reason for the R&D tax credit? You are spot on. It, uh, it was originally defined in 1981, you know, when we were losing business. I think that was uh, uh, during Ronald Reagan's uh, uh, term as president. And we were losing business inter to internationally, internationally. And mm -hmm. so to stay competitive, one, a lot of other countries had incentives out there for their mm -hmm. businesses. We did not. The R&D tax credit was defined to help keep 
business in the United States and help us to can you like you mentioned continually grow technology wise to mm -hmm. be innovative to be the leader in these industries and so that's that's the the the, the point of it that's why it's out there okay now can you give us an example like you had a client obviously not disclosing the client's name but you have a client they you know, you notice, you know, X amount of dollars were going to be spent on taxes or that was their tax liability. As a result of using R&D tax credit, they were able to save X amount on taxes and were able to use such technology. Yep. Yeah. So, so general, let me, let me, before I do that and sorry, yeah. um, because you asked this as well, the yeah, yeah. industries that, that qualify for, yes. mm -hmm. for the R&D tax credit. And then from the industries, we can build it into what the benefit is to those industries. So manufacturer is the largest user of the R&D tax credit, but not the only user. Mm -hmm. Software development is probably the second most common user of the R&D tax credit. And the software can be Either I'm a software developer, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm manufacturing products, you know, software, I'm designing products that I'm selling. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, like Intuit with QuickBooks, yeah. you know, I develop QuickBooks. That's an R&D tax credit project that okay. has, that meets the four part test, but I can also be a, you know, a financial advisor yeah. that I develop software to help me help my clients manage their investments and their portfolios. And, and so if I'm not selling that, but I've developed software that's unique to the industry, um, that can be used too. So, so now there's, you know, you wouldn't expect a financial advisor to be doing R and D tax credit activities, mm -hmm. potentially that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so software development, engineering in general any type of engineering usually mm -hmm. qualifies you know engineering within construction you have to be careful but we can find that there's areas there that qualify architecture is an area that we can find r d tax credit but honestly any industry that meets that four-part test and and if you look irs puts out a uh, a document every year that explains the industries mm -hmm. that have taken advantage of the credit. And you look on there and pretty much every industry you can think of has at some level taken advantage of the R&D tax credit. And a lot of them that you wouldn't have thought mm -hmm. is usually software based. They're developing some software to help manage their business and that can potentially qualify. Okay. So have now, you ever been, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the benefit, but go ahead, ask your question. Um, have you ever been in a situation where, and sorry if I'm throwing too many questions, I'm actually just really intrigued by this. No, no, uh, you you keep going. I tell you, <laughs> you know, we can do a four hour webinar, if, I mean, a four hour podcast if you want. So I'm good. <laughs> have you been in a situation where you have a company, for example, they are a, a software development company slash like digital marketing agency. They, they, they create products for their clients. And then they tell one of their clients, that they could qual not not qualify for RD credits, but they just generally bring it up to them. Obviously, not giving out tax advice, and then you end up helping that client through that software development company. Yeah, yeah. No, no. We, that's happened. We get referrals. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning, most of our business comes straight from the CPA firm. Yeah. But when we're in out at a client, we often you know get the the whole um, you know. Bob and Sally are talking and, and, and Sally tells Bob that she just did this R and D tax credit and she mm -hmm. thinks his industry might qualify too. And then we talk to Bob and, and, and we help Bob. But when I do that, I want to talk to the CPA firm right mm -hmm. away as well. I want to let them know that, that, you know, we were referred to their client and this is what we're talking about and make sure everybody's comfortable and, 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 and educate. I do a ton of education. Okay. Um, I mean, I, in fact, right before you and I started talking today, I just finished up a webinar and weekly I'm doing webinars, so which I enjoy. So so I educate that CPA and, and 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 then talk to them. So that that their clients, you know, uh usually when their clients let them know that we're talking and we can talk to them, they're very happy that we're able to support them and the rest of their clients as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's go to the, you were talking about benefits briefly, and then I kind of cut you off. What no, were you gonna good. say about benefits? So, so in general, so the credit, you know, like we said before, offset taxes, sometimes you can use it to offset payroll taxes. The credit is a good estimate of a potential credit for a taxpayer is, you know, let's look, let's say we're in a software development mm -hmm. setting and we have, you know, 10 programmers mm -hmm. and their total payroll is uh, $1.5 million mm -hmm. for the, the and, and we're going to say that every one of those programmers counts a uh, hundred percent of their wages into the calculation of the credit. Cause that's all they're doing. They're developing product. 
And so, and, and most of this, the credit is based on wages for the most part wages, um, but sometimes in manufacturing materials and some other things, but let's, let's stick with software. So we have $1.5 million of wages that are, we're paying for our programmers to do R and D. Mm -hmm. The credit, usually a good estimate of the credit is about 10% of those costs. So what happens is I take that 1.5 million, I determine that that's $150,000 credit. Um, the credit usually is tax, not usually, it's tax affected. So let's just say that that one point, that $150,000 credit is about uh, $120,000 of benefit. I actually get to take that $120,000 and reduce my tax by that amount. So if I owed $200,000 mm -hmm. when I did my tax return, all of a sudden I only owe $80,000. So it's, a, it's significant dollars that go back into businesses. And that's a difference between a credit and a deduction, right? A credit directly reduces the taxes owed, yep. whereas a deduction reduces the taxable income. Yes, perfect. You mm -hmm. said it perfect. So yeah, if I have a, if I have a hundred thousand dollar tax deduction, mm -hmm. corporate tax rates are twenty one percent. I'm mm -hmm. going to save twenty one thousand mm -hmm. dollars. If I have a hundred thousand dollar tax credit, I save a hundred thousand okay. dollars. So that's so the difference. Credit is much better than deduction. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And then okay, uh, I, I get it about the R and D. Any business could do it. The four part test. Um, really, there's no industry specific. Technically, any. Uh, as long as you meet the four part test, that makes sense. Um, now let's merge into the employee retention credit. You were mentioning before we started recording, that's like a hot topic now. So what is it and, and what makes it like really uh, hot right now? Yep. So the employee retention credit is, uh, you know, we're, we're taping this in, in 2021 right now. People might be listening to it four years from now. Mm -hmm. They'll look back and say, oh, yeah, you guys went through that uh, a, a coronavirus pandemic back then, didn't you? Well, the employee retention credit is an incentive out there huh? that was put into place to help businesses navigate the pandemic. Um, and, and what it does is it puts money back in. I'll give you a little background. You can tell me if I'm getting really boring or not, but <laughs> this is such an unbelievable incentive that okay. I just could go forever on it. And I won't, I promise <laughs> I won't go forever. Um, but the employee retention credit was defined back in March of 20, mm -hmm. you know, at, to help businesses. But when it was defined, if you took the payroll protection program, the PPP loan, mm -hmm. you could not take the employee retention credit. Okay. They, were, they were mutually exclusive. You couldn't mm -hmm. do both. And so nobody really paid attention to the employee retention credit. At the end of last year, at the end of 20, yeah. um, a new tax bill came out called the Consolidated Appropriation Act. I'm going to bore people with these tax <laughs> codes. No, but the, the, this came out right at the end of, uh, of 2020. And this new legislation said... Mm -hmm. Never mind. We changed our mind. If you took a PPP loan, you can still okay. take the employee retention credit. And they made this retroactive all the way back to the beginning of March, basically March 13th of 2020. And so now businesses that qualify could take both PPP and ERC, employee retention credit. Okay. But not only that, it has now been extended. It originally was defined to end at the end of 20 between the CAA and then the ARP, which is the American Rescue Plan, which came out in March of 21, mm -hmm. the ERC, wow, a lot of acronyms. The ERC has been extended till the end of 21 and enhanced. And so now, not to go real deep in it, but if a business qualifies, and I'll tell you how they qualify in a minute, but if a business qualifies, you can have up to $33,000 credit per employee. Okay, that's wow. up to, and that's if you qualified all the way from March 13th last year till the end of 21. Mm -hmm. 33, so if you're a, a 10 person business, not a big business, there's potentially $330,000 of tax credit sitting there and it's a refundable credit. It's not like R&D where I had to offset taxes. Mm -hmm. If I determine there's a 330,000 or you determine there's a $330,000 credit for your client, for you as a taxpayer, you receive a $330,000 refund. IRS sends you a check. So it is money. It, that's why it's such a, an exciting topic. And, and when I read this legislation, which I'm going to make myself look really boring now because I was reading the, the legislation and the, at early January when this came out, and I looked at this and I just became obsessed with it. I mean, this opportunity for taxpayers is just tremendous. Uh, and the number of taxpayers that can use this to put money back into their business is amazing. 
And let me expand on that mm -hmm. then. So this definition, you know, came out that you can qualify now all the way to 21, the end of 21, potentially the, the value of the credit. I told you the value for 2020 is five up to $5,000 per employee for the year mm -hmm. in 21, that became a quarterly credit. And now it's up to $7,000 per employee per quarter. Okay. And that's where the, so you can get up to $28,000 a year per an employee in 21 um, to qualify. Mm -hmm. You have to do one of two things. And I'm going to say this real simple and then we can spend on a, expand on it if you want. Um, but there's a requirement that you either, either mm -hmm. or, not both, either show a reduction in revenue in any quarter in 20 or 21. That reduction is defined different each year, but a reduction in revenue in any of those quarters or your ability to conduct your business as normal was restricted by a government order. So you, you know, you know, COVID-19, uh, somebody, the government's put some restriction on there that says, okay, you have to reduce capacity in your business. You have to close. No one can go into the office for a certain amount of time. Um, you, you are a manufacturer. Let's go to manufacturing. You're a manufacturer and your suppliers were affected. They were shut down. They couldn't get the product to you that you needed to continue your operation. So now, you have been affected by a government order and you can qualify. So reduction in revenue or a government order has restricted your ability to conduct your business as you normally would have pre-COVID. One of those two, and it's, you need to look deeper to see what the value of this is for you. Okay. So I have a couple of questions. So what, um, what defines employee? Is it, could it be a 1099 contractor? Cause that's a good question. Uh, employee is W2 employee. Okay. So it has to be W-2. Huh. Um, it includes everything that's, uh, you know, taxable wages. On Pretty much it's basically wages that are subject to Medicare. So uh -huh. you don't subtract okay. out your 401k or anything. It's your gross wages uh, that you're paid. Um, and that also includes pre-tax health insurance. Okay. So if you had pre-tax health insurance, that adds to that. So for the year 2020, it's $10,000 of wages max per employee. And that's 50% of that. So for 2020, I've got a nine and a half month period. If I qualify that I can try to, you know, see if I can get every one of my employees up to 10,000 of qualified wages. Mm -hmm. So it's easier in 2020. In 2021, it's a quarterly credit. And so mm -hmm. now I have to analyze my employees on a quarterly basis. And then the, 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 the complication that comes in with this is there's a few complications, but if you did take a PPP loan, you mm -hmm. can qualify, but you cannot use the same dollars you use for PPP loan forgiveness in the calculation of ERC. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to you know, analyze what dollars make sense for forgiveness, what mm -hmm. dollars make sense for ERC. And when we're in 21, that's extremely important if you have a PPP2 loan, because your PPP2 loan can span three quarters you know, it's just a 24 week forgiveness period. And in those quarters, I also want to maximize every employee as high, as close as possible to $10,000 of qualified wages. So I need to do a lot of analysis to determine which wages I pull out for forgiveness, which I pull out for ERC and make sure I maximize those dollars. And just one more thing on this, that 10 person business I've been using as, as an example, mm -hmm. if they have a PPP2 loan, we just did a scenario where by not allocating correctly in the year 2021, that small business could lose thirty-five dollars to $50,000 in refundable credit by not doing the correct analysis and allocating wages. So it's really important to, to make sure you look at the total picture of all your incentives. Okay. Yeah. And this is where we mentioned earlier complex. This is, this is complex, you know, tax planning and, and tax strategies. Now, as far as documentation goes, do you need to document for this credit, either if it's one reduction uh, in revenue? Obviously, I mean, that's documented because, right. you know, you, but number two, the normal part, how do you have to like write it out that, and say, you know, you know, my business, we have X amount of clients that come in this way or through walk-in business. And as a result of the pandemic and the orders, the government orders, our, that number was reduced, therefore not normal or, or abnormal or however you want to do. Do you have to do that with this one? Yeah. So, so you, you, man, you are spot on with your questions here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to make a mark that check that off. I'm going to remember that. Did you know what you're talking about here? Um, yes. So for the reduction of revenue, that's a safe Harbor rule. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I'll, I'll expand on that. For the year 20, it's a 50% reduction in revenue in a quarter. Mm-hmm. So I have to show five zero for 50% reduction. If I do that, safe harbor, no questions asked, I qualify. My documentation is showing my quarterly revenue from 2020 to 2019 and show a reduction. Mm-hmm. In 21, that actually reduces to 20% reduction, again, compared to 19. Okay. And so it's, it's easier from a math standpoint to show that. Um, and so that's our documentation if we qualify with the reduction of revenue. But mm-hmm. if we don't qualify under that, now I have to prove that this government order has restricted my business. And so one, we just need to know all the orders. You know, yeah. it could be a federal, state, local, city, county. There was a lot of orders, restrictions put on businesses, you know, based on the government entity. And it can't be a suggestion. It has to be something we follow. We have to follow this. Yeah. Our, may, our mayor says, you have to do this yeah. Yeah. or you're going to be in violation of yeah. the law. Okay, this is so we have to look at that. So, so our responsibility is one, show that there was a government order that affected us. Okay. And then two, show how that affected us. Now, there's not a requirement that we have a reduction in revenue with the government order, but that helps, you know, because if I can show, you know, I had a 30% reduction in revenue because I'm a retail operation and mm-hmm. my capacity was reduced and we can only do curbside pickup or, you know, or delivery. Well, that's a pretty good scenario that uh, I can document pretty well to support that. Um, if I had an increase in revenue, which is possible, if a portion of my business is affected. So there's a secondary safe harbor rule that says, if more than 10% of my 2019 revenue consisted of a segment of my business that was affected by a government shutdown, Mm -hmm. the scenario I like to talk about is a uh, a bar that that has both a bar and a liquor store. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so bar, I'm in Illinois, bar, most of the year, shut down. Yep. Mm -hmm. Liquor store? everybody was drinking at home. And so <laughs> liquor store revenue went way up. Yeah. Bar revenue was almost non-existent. Yeah. Overall revenue was up for this business. And this is a real life scenario. I'm telling you, yeah. I didn't, I'm not making this up in my head. This, yeah. this actually happened. Overall revenue was up because the liquor store business went so high, even though bar res- revenue was down, bar revenue was more than 10% of total revenue in 2019. And so now I meet a secondary safe harbor that says a segment of my business that ex, ex, that, that consisted of more than 10% of my 2019 revenue was affected by a government order. And therefore now I qualify. So you, 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 there's no just steadfast rule yeah, that says, yeah. if I have this, I qualify, you need to dig deep. And I, I honestly, I do this I have calls almost every half hour of every day with taxpayers looking at this. So I talk about this scenario nonstop. And and so I've really learned how to dig deep into what they potentially have. And if they do, if they don't have a credit, I'll tell them they don't have a credit. If they Mm -hmm. have a credit, well, then we'll dig deeper. Yeah. And that was my next point is that you don't have to like memorize all everything in here in this podcast. This is just to give you an idea of these tax credits. But more importantly, is that you can talk to Randy, right? They can call you, they can go to your website, they can get in contact with you and then schedule these appointments with you to actually learn if they could actually qualify for these credits, which is obviously something you want to do. Um, it's not something that you want to just do online, you know, some sort of tax prep online where you can just kind of figure it out on your own. This is complex, complex tax strategies, especially post, you know, 2020 uh, of all these uh, regulations, PPP loans, EIDL, we can, like you said, we can keep going, just talking about this stuff and, and you know, just talking about these two credits only. Yeah, we could, but um, there's between yeah. the two, lots of money available. There's been a lot of money thrown out <laughs> this last <laughs> year. And this is just another one of those. And a lot of the businesses and most of them that, that we're dealing with need this money. So it's important to put it back in the business. Okay. How, um, so how does it work working with you? Do you, is it like, for example, I reach out to you, you do find out we could do a credit. Is it like a free consultation part? Oh, yeah. initially? And yeah. then the, after that, moving forward, is it like an hourly rate that you charge or is it like a, how does it work? Tell me a bit more about that part, the actually working with you part. Yeah. And so, so what we do is, is, is like you just said, we do basically all our analysis with no charge. Okay. You know, we do an engagement letter that will cap our fees at a percentage of the benefit, you know, smaller clients would probably be around 15%, you know, larger clients, it depends. I mean, 
you know, hundred employees, you know, maybe it goes down to 10%. If you get over a hundred, you know, we've done, you know, multi-million dollar credits. Well, then it's a, you know, case by case, how we quote that. Cause it's going to be a very small percentage of the, of the benefit. Um, but it's easier on the uh, smaller clients to be able to say, yes, it's 15% just cause we know the work that's going in. And, and that work is pretty much standard at any level. But as you get bigger, the per employee time goes down a little bit. So it's, it's based on a percentage, but Based, the fact that it's based on a percentage means when we start to do our whole analysis and, and, and jumping in and determine if there's something there, well, if there's nothing there, you don't notice anything. Yeah. If there's something there, then that's when invoicing would kick in. And, and we don't expect to get paid until the refunds are received by the taxpayer. We don't, we're not there to reduce their current cash position. Mm -hmm. uh, we're there to increase it and we'll just take a portion when they receive that uh, cash inflow. So okay. that's how we work. And, and it's pretty straightforward. It, it, from a time standpoint, that's an important thing for, for taxpayers. You know, they want the benefit. They don't want to spend the time on it, which I yeah. understand. They're trying to have, in some cases, they're trying to survive right now. They don't have time to put into this. And there's not a whole lot of time. We just, we ask for certain documents. Once we get them, if it's a, if it's a reduction of revenue, we can jump into the calculation. Mm -hmm. If it's a government you know, order, then we just have to have another, you know, hour, half hour conversation so that we can start our documentation of the narrative of why and how a government order affected them. Okay, nice. And um, I let's kind of like wind it down. You know, how can yep. how can listeners get in contact with you? So best way is probably just go to our website, mm -hmm. um, which is you know try t r i dash merit m e r i t dot com. On there, there's an about us section. I think meet the team, something like that. You can find out any. You can find out all my information from there. Um, my phone numbers on there go straight to my cell at least these days so um i'm always people are always surprised they're like wait you just answer the phone <laughs> yes I, I do a i do a lot of webinars and so uh you know people are uh you know i've probably educated you know six thousand cpas this year on the erc so far so uh, they always seem to be surprised when i answer the phone but if they want to talk erc i want to talk it it's just such an exciting topic mm -hmm. so um, it should go straight to me if they call my emails there as well. I don't want, you know, 10,000 calls. I can't handle that, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have no problem people calling me. Okay, perfect. I'll be sure to add in all the links to, of ways to people connect with you. Yep. Um, and yeah, and I think we should definitely do a webinar in the future. I could talk more about infinite banking and then how we can kind of combine these together and give oh, like yeah. turbocharged tax savings to clients. Um, I think that'd be a really good idea. Uh, Randy, I really appreciate you yeah. coming on the show and, and sharing your knowledge and your experience and your wisdom with us. Um, I look forward to having you back on. Well, I appreciate you having me. This was fun. And uh, anytime I get to talk to a knowledgeable person like yourself, it, uh, <laughs> it, it makes a lot better for me. No, thank you. That's okay. it, right? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. We One wrapped. Second. All right. To learn more about what we do and how we can help you grow more wealth, please visit www.finassetprotection.com. That's F-I-N, asset protection.com. The topics presented in this podcast are for general information only and not for the purposes of providing legal accounting or investment advice. On such matters, please consult a professional who knows your specific situation.